Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu and by extension commands every single one of us, all of the believers, by saying what? قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Say, all of us are supposed to say what? O oh, people of the scripture, Ahl al-Kitab, Jews and Christians, come to a word that is equitable between us and you. We are supposed to do what? We are supposed to try our best to figure out what do we have in common? What do we see is in common between our scripture and your scripture. The only way that the Muslim can fulfill this obligation is if they have some knowledge of our scripture and knowledge of their scripture as well. And by the way, this is a command to all Muslims, even those living in Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Somalia, Muslim majority countries. It's a command to all Muslims to know our scripture and even their scriptures. How much more does it apply to us who live as a, min as a minority surrounded by Christians. I hope we see that it's even more applicable to us to be familiar. Therefore, we should be aware of the position of traditional Orthodox Jews because traditional Orthodox Jews are the ones who are anti-Zionist. We've seen them. We've seen these Torah observant Jews standing alongside Muslims at protests, protesting Zionism. They are at pro-Palestinian demonstrations and rallies. Why? Because they believe that they are in exile from the Holy Land as a result of disobedience to God. This is their belief. And by the way, we should be aware. We should be very aware and we should talk about the fact that they believe, and it's a fact, that subhanAllah, every single Jew, whether they be a layman or a scholar, 150 years ago, they all believed that they were in exile and they all had to wait for the Messiah until they could have a land. This was the ijma, this was the consensus opinion amongst all rabbis 150 years ago, that they were divinely mandated into diaspora. Diaspora means that you have to live in other people's lands. You can't have your own government. And that's been the case for the past 2000 years. And they can only have their own land when the Messiah comes. And there are many verses of the Bible that they point to and say, look, just because it's a holy land doesn't mean it's ours. They point to Jeremiah 16, 13 that says, so I will throw you out of this land into a land neither you nor your ancestors have known. Be why? And you look at the context because of their disobedience. You find in Deuteronomy 28, 63, you will be uprooted from the land you are entering, into, you are entering to possess. So even though you want to go into this land, you, you want it to be yours, you're going to be uprooted. It's not going to work. Why? Because of disobedience. You find in Ezekiel 33, uh, from verses 24 to 26, it talks about how they thought they were many, big in number. We should be able to get our land. They said, but we are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. They felt this confidence. Therefore, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it and look to your idols and shed blood, should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword. You do detestable things, and each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Should you then possess the land? You find the Bible is quite clear. The Old Testament is quite clear. Do you really think you're going to get the promise if you are so disobedient? This is the traditional Orthodox Jewish belief and view that establishing a land now would be in rebellion to God. And I heard one rabbi say it quite beautifully. He said, imagine if a parent tells his child, you're in timeout for 10 minutes. One minute goes by, the kid gets bored and starts walking around saying, I'm going to do whatever I want. Clearly, this is what? Rebellion. And clearly, he's probably going to be punished even more because of such rebellion. So what happens, according to the Old Testament? What happens when you try to end this exile early? It seems that they're going to be punished even worse for it. Not according to us, according to this Old Testament. Early the next morning, they set out for the highest point in the hill country, saying, now we are ready to go up to the land the Lord promised. We're ready to go to the land the Lord promised, surely we have sinned. But Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. There will be no success in this. Do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. This is why all of these traditional Orthodox Jews are screaming, don't do this. This is a bad idea. It's going to fail. The Lord is not with you. We are doing this in disobedience. It's going to get bad. It's going to get ugly. Not because we say so, but because this is according to their own 
beliefs. And again, this is not some fringe idea. Just a little while ago, this was the ijma, consensus opinion of all Jews. In fact, Moses even said what? In Deuteronomy 31, 29, for I know that after my death, you are surely to become utterly corrupt and to turn from the way I have commanded you. In days to come, disaster will fall on you because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord and arouse his anger by what your hands have made. What your hands have made. I want us all to pay close attention. Each of these verses is highlighting what? The emphasis is on being righteous. Righteousness gives you victory. When you are wicked, then unfortunately, victory will not come. So if this is the consensus opinion, or was the consensus opinion, why did Zionism arrive, arise? Where did this come from? Well, it wasn't born out of some sort of rabbinical scholarship. It wasn't like the scholars amongst the Jews were reading their text and saying, oh, we came up with a new opinion. No, that's not the case. It was born out of what? European racism. European racism gave birth to Zionism. The goal of Zionism is to establish a Jewish ethnostate, not a righteous religious state, an ethnostate, shifting the focus away from Torah observance towards what? Ethnicity. Why? Because they were persecuted based on their ethnicity. So in response to that, what did they do? Let's create our own state. This was because of the sins of Europe. Theodor Herzl was a Jewish atheist, and it was him who founded the state of Israel. Theodore. Theodore means gift of God. SubhanAllah, he doesn't even believe in God. And he's the one who started this whole state that's supposed to be a religious state, and yet it is founded by an atheist. And today, somebody who is ethnically Jewish has the quote-unquote right of return, even if they are atheists. They could just show up and say, hey, I'm from such and such country, but I want land here in Palestine, and they'll give you, you know, you can be a settler, take somebody else's land, no problem. It doesn't matter if you're a believer. You could be a full-blown atheist. Don't even believe that there's a God. And subhanAllah, as long as you don't convert to Islam, if you're ethnically Jewish and you embrace Islam, no, no, then we don't want you. But as long as you're either atheist or Jewish or whatever the case may be, then of course it is your land. SubhanAllah, even the Israeli historian Elon Pape jokes about how ridiculous this is. He says, most Zionists don't believe that God exists, but they do believe that he has promised them Palestine. They don't believe that God exists, but he promised them Palestine. How does that work? SubhanAllah. You can tell this is not a religious state because subhanAllah, in the whole world, the second biggest pride parade on all of planet Earth after Los Angeles is where? In Tel Aviv. That's where they are having hundreds of thousands of people lining up for the pride parade right next to Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you imagine this? Right next to the place that these people were punished. They are celebrating such a sin. Does this sound like religiosity to you? So what about all the Muslims and the Christians? By the way, Muslims and Christians make up most of the world. We, as Muslims and Christians, all agree that their Messiah, our Messiah, did in fact come. We all agree that Messiah Isa alayhi salam, did indeed come. We may differ. They say that he's God. We say that he is a prophet, that he is the leader. But we both agree that he is the Messiah, the awaited Messiah. And he did come 2,000 years ago. We also agree that the Israelites tried to kill him, but not by their own hands, but through the hands of the Romans. And of course, they say, the Christians say that they succeeded. We say, no, Allah saved him. But subhanAllah, here we are today. How amazing. Looks like there's nothing new under the sun. 2,000 years later, and now you have the Israelis who are committing genocide on all those believers in the Messiah. Who believes in the Messiah? The Christians and the Muslims. And subhanAllah, all the Palestinian Christians and all the Palestinian Muslims are having a genocide committed against them. By who? By the Israelis. By their own hands? No. By the help of the hands of who? The new Roman Empire. SubhanAllah, nothing changes. The new Roman Empire, which is who? The Western nations. SubhanAllah, 2,000 years later, and we still got the same story being run over and over again. Meanwhile, here in the West, SubhanAllah, every Christian is shopping and getting ready and buying gifts and wrapping their stuff and getting their eggnog ready and decorating their trees, getting ready for Christmas, which is what? The celebration of the birth of the world's Favorite Palestinian, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, the West Bank, subhanAllah and azim. Meanwhile, in Palestine, I'm sure we've all seen the video, the Christian churches in Palestine refuse to celebrate Christmas because they're being systematically exterminated, subhanAllah. How does the West justify this genocide? How do they justify supporting and funding such a genocide? The answer is Christian Zionism. And this is what I want you all to focus on today. Christian Zionism. Every time you hear this word, I want you to think 
oxymoron, square circle. It doesn't make sense. A married bachelor, there's no such thing. There should be no such thing as a Christian Zionist. It doesn't make sense. And let's analyze why. And by the way, they make up the majority. I saw one statistic, it said, for every one Jewish Zionist, there are 30 Christian Zionists. That's how big they are in terms of number, subhanAllah. These are the people that we need to address. They live all around us. We need to teach them about their own book, insha'Allah ta'ala. We need to be equipped. Come to common terms as between us and you. Let's figure out what we can agree upon. So, they would say, well, yes, I'm a Christian Zionist because God promised the land, this holy land, Palestine, to the seed of Abraham. And those are the Jewish people. And they'll quote Genesis 12, 7 and say, to you, Abraham, to your offspring, I will give this land. First and foremost, the offspring of Ibrahim salam, is Ismail and Ishaq, both of them, the Jews and the Arabs. But let's not even worry about that. That's just a smaller point. They ignore that entirely. Much more interestingly is a very important concept. I want everybody to remember this concept of what? Replacement theology. Replacement theology. Another fancy word for it is covenantal supersessionism, whatever. What it means is what? That the concept of the holy people, God's children, the children of Israel, this idea gets replaced from the Jewish people to the Christian ones. Why? Why is that the case? Take a look at your Bible. Take a look at the New Testament. In Galatians 3.16, Paul says what? The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to his seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, singular, meaning one person who is Christ. So when the Old Testament says, we're promising you this land to your seed, the Bible says, Paul says, the New Testament says, this seed is representing Isa alayhi salam, not all of Bani Israel. Not all the Jews. So how can the Christian Zionists get away with this? Are they not reading their own Bible? Don't they read Galatians? And furthermore, Galatians 3, 29, just two chapters later, excuse me, a few verses later, it says what? If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if you belong to Christ, if you believe in Isa alayhi salam, oh, and by the way, Muslims do believe in Isa alayhi salam. Christians do believe in Isa alayhi salam. Then you are Abraham's seed, and therefore you are deserving of this promise. So does Bani Israel get it? Not according to the Bible. And yet we are surrounded by Christian Zionists. Do we ever challenge them? Well, unfortunately we can't because we don't read books. We're not educated on this matter. But we should be. We need to equip ourselves with knowledge because knowledge is power. Furthermore, it gets deeper. Isa alayhi salam, according to the New Testament, in the book of John, now again, I'm not saying everything that the book of John says I agree with. As a Muslim, I can't say that everything is said there is true. But the Christians do believe in this, and what does it say? It says quite clearly that Isa alayhi salam, that Jesus had a debate with the Jewish scholars. Debating, are you considered the, the seed of Abraham or not? Abraham is our father, they said. But then he responds, if you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only, fa the only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own, God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil and you want to carry out your father's desires. The Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 39 to 44. The whole concept that, oh, we are the chosen people, the children of God, Abraham's seed. Jesus is debating this to them directly, saying, nope, sorry, it doesn't work like that. If you accepted me, that would be true, but you reject me. And because you reject me and try to kill me, because of that fact, therefore you're the father, not, excuse me, your father is not Abraham, your father's actually the devil. It goes even deeper. In 1 John 2, 22, it says what? Who is the liar? Whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, whoever denies the Father and the Son, this is the Antichrist, the Dajjal. Do Muslims accept Isa alayhi salam as the Messiah? Yes. Do Christians? Yes. Again, we differ as to what that means, but we both accept that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. We both believe that. But Israel doesn't. So should Christians be funding Israel's goals if the Bible says that they are antichrists? 
We need to be asking these questions. We need to be asking these questions, but that's only possible if we know these quotes. If we can talk to these people who are funding this and put them on the, in the hot seat. How are you funding this? When your Bible says these people are Dajjalun, Dajjajila. They are the antichrists. How can you be supporting their goals? What is their goal? Do we know? Yes. The goal of Zionism is to establish a third temple. Establishing a third temple is completely blasphemous according to Christianity. Why? Well, because there was a first temple that was built by Sulaiman that was destroyed 400 years later by the Babylonians. Then there was a second temple that was built by the Jews who were returning from exile and then it was destroyed 420 years later by the Romans. Now Israel wants a third temple. However, the Christians say that the temple no longer is valid. Why? Because the body of Christ, the body of Isa a.s. replaced it. This is not our beliefs. This is something we differ on, but it is in the Gospel of John. It says what? Jesus told them, speaking to these Jewish rabbis, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. This is Christian belief. There is no room for a third temple because that's the body of Jesus. That's what they believe. And yet you have Christian Zionists, every politician saying we need to support Israel in their goals to build a third temple. That is blasphemy. That is completely going against their own book. We're supposed to be waking them up and saying, look, yes, I invite you to Islam, but if you're not going to be a Muslim, at least be a decent Christian. Read your own book. How are you funding this? If this is the work of Dajjal, and furthermore, it gets even more specific. Subhanallah. Not only did Isa a.s., according to the New Testament, predict the destruction of the second temple, and he never mentioned the construction of a third temple, because, of course, the book of John is emphasizing that his body is the temple. But in addition to that, it says that the Antichrist, not just his supporters, but the actual Antichrist himself, the Jal himself, will sit and claim to be God in a third temple. You don't believe me? Take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So there will be a third temple mentioned that there will be a third temple but who will reside in it who will be there claiming to be God according to the New Testament subhanAllah it'll be the Dajjal himself this is according to their book and they're funding and sending money to Israel meanwhile because they reject the Messiah they're all considered Dajjalun and they're building something that is ultimately predicted to house the Dajjal himself and we are sitting back and saying, I never heard any of this stuff in my life. I just live around these people. I never talk to them. This is really a problem. It seems like everybody is just failing. It's like just surrounded by failure. When is, when is it enough? Guys, please, iqra, read a book, learn, have a conversation. SubhanAllah. Inshallah, we'll continue in the second khutbah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. As Muslims, we need to get a little bit serious about calling to our deen. We need to stop playing defense. They've been asking us for the past 20 years since 9-11, what's jihad, what's ji what is jihad, what is this jihad? Every time asking us, us about jihad and we have to answer them a thousand times over, no, we're not terrorists. We need to play a little bit more offense instead of always playing defense. Why do they even know about this word jihad? Do you guys speak Arabic? No, they'll say, oh, I don't speak Arabic. Or do you study fiqh? Islamic, no, I don't study that stuff. SubhanAllah, a lot of money and a lot of advertising made sure that every American knows the word jihad, even though they don't speak Arabic, they're not Muslim, and they don't study fiqh. Yet they all know this one word. That's a lot of effort that has been put in to make sure that word is in their mind. You know what word isn't in their mind? Kharem. What is kharem? Kharem, simply put, is to annihilate a group of people. It is, more technically, to sacrifice an entire group of people for the sake of God. In other words, committing genocide in the name of God. It's mentioned all over the Bible. I think we should be done answering about jihad. Yeah, yeah, we've been talking about it for many years. I think it's now time to switch it up. Tell me about kharem. If they say, I don't know, why do you know about jihad and you don't know about kharem? It's very odd. Jihad has actual rules. You can't go around killing women and children, non-combatants, elderly, religious clergy. You can't go around destroying even trees and animals. You have to be very particular in fighting only oppressive combatants. So we know the fiqh of jihad, and we could talk about that another day. 
But subhanAllah, why is that in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16 and 17? It talks about what? Annihilating an entire people, do not leave alive anything that breathes. It's pretty heavy. In the conquest of Jericho, it says, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both men and women, young and old, and oxen, and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword, impaling people, even the animals? Why? Do you guys believe in this stuff? Why are we on the defensive? Go on the offensive. Ask. Why are you supporting this genocide? Why does your book promote genocide? Why does it say to, about the Am 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 Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15:3? Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and spare not, spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling. Suckling baby? The Bible says to go slaughter a suckling child? Wow. Oxen and sheep, camel and donkey. We have to ask them, do you support the genocide of children? And if they say, oh, well, that was for that time, you have to say, no, that's false. It's not just for that time. Netanyahu just re recently told his soldiers to treat the Palestinians like the Amalek. So this scripture applies today. And they'll say, yeah, well, that's their opinion. I mean, I don't support it. False again. You do support it through your tax dollars. And they say, yeah, but I don't control our political leaders. Yes, you do. False again. You guys vote. Be a little aggressive. You have to put them on the spot. Be relentless. If you've answered the question of jihad a thousand times, it's, start, it's time to get started in asking them, what is kharem? What is this concept? Ask a thousand. You can text somebody after this khutbah. Start your count. One, two, three, keep going. We should not be on the defensive. Final few points, inshallah ta'ala. Yes, we know that not all of Ahlul Kitab are the same. Alhamdulillah, Islam teaches us to be a little bit more nuanced. Allah ta'ala says, وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنْهُ بِقِنْطَارٍ يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ And among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, is he who if you entrust him with a great amount of wealth, he's going to return it to you. There's just ones amongst them. We don't paint them all with the same brush because the Quran teaches us to see the nuance. But at the same time, and among them is he who if you entrust him with a single silver coin, he will not return it to you unless you are constantly standing over him. The Quran is clear in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 75, that there's differences amongst them. We don't paint them all with the same brush. So we have to see the good and the bad. We have to see them for who they are. So this is not some sort of call to labeling or somehow judging harshly a group of people. No, understand that within them, within all Jews and Christians, there are different people. However, just as a final point, brothers and sisters, we are so amazed at the bravery of the people of Palestine. And yet we can, we can get involved in this struggle here as well. It might not be a physical fight. It might not be a physical battle. Ours is, in this part of the world, intellectual in nature. And it's scary to me, and it's sad to me, that we are terrified of a conversation. Meanwhile, we're watching people who are not even afraid of tanks. We're watching people who are not afraid of tanks, and us, we're petrified of a conversation. Why? Because we have no knowledge. Maybe we're petrified of books, I don't know. But if you inform yourself, Stop making excuses, educate yourself, equip yourself with the necessary information, then you might be able to make a difference. Yes, protesting is good, and may Allah bless everybody that went to a protest, but you have to admit, it's a little basic and unsophisticated, right? Just going out and screaming slogans, it's not that sophisticated. And I question if it can really transfer or, or, or transform hearts and minds. However, with a little bit of knowledge, you might actually be able to quote not only your beliefs, but their beliefs and say, read your own book, and I believe this has much more of a persuasive strength to it. The Prophet ﷺ was commanded to make dua to increase in one thing and one thing only, and that was knowledge. It wasn't wealth, it wasn't power. The Prophet ﷺ was commanded, Qul, Rabbi zidni ilma. Oh Allah, increase me in knowledge. So we should make dua that we know and we recognize that knowledge is power. May Allah Ta'ala make us people who are, who are knowledgeable and can help convey more useful information so that we can call people to what is common between us, between the Ahl al-Kitab, because alhamdulillah there are lots that we need to educate ourselves and others as well. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa aafi man fi man aafayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa barik lana fi ma aafayt, wa qina sharra ma qadayt, fa innaka taqdi wa la yukhda alayk, innahu la yathilu man walayt, wa la yaizu man aadayt, barakta rabbana wa ta'alayt, rabbana atina fi dunya hasra, wa fi al-akhirati hasna wa qina azab al-nar, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 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 wa sallallahu alayhi w